Good afternoon. My name is Soren Brothers, and I'm Rams Allen and Elaine Schiff, Curator of Climate Change. I'm delighted that you could join us today for Curated Conversation, a digital program that explores themes and subjects from ROM collections alongside industry professionals. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the ROM sits on what has been the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabeg Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. My guest for today's program was named as one of time's 100 most influential people and as a UN champion of the earth. Catherine Hayhoe is an atmospheric scientist whose research focuses on understanding what climate change means for people and the places where we live. She's the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy and a Horn Distinguished Professor and Endowed Professor of Public Policy and Public Law in the Department of Political Science at Texas Tech University. Her book, Saving Us, a climate scientist case for hope and healing in a divided world was released in September, 2021 and is available now at the ROM Boutique. Catherine also hosts the PBS digital series, Global Weirding, which is currently in its fifth season. During today's program, you can submit questions to us via the Q&A feature on screen or by using Poll Everywhere, which is an online platform that allows you to interact with the questions. A link to Poll Everywhere will be in the chat. And Catherine, please uh, welcome to join you. Welcome to join us. I am here. Great to be with you. So great to have you here, Catherine. Um, really excited to start this off. And I, and I thought I would just start with a little bit of a background story in terms of how I even first heard about you, um, which was when I was a teacher in Utah, Logan, Utah. Uh, I was teaching a, a climate change section in a watershed sciences course. And I just moved there from Toronto and I was thinking about, okay, I'm in a small town in a small conservative place. I know a lot of the students who I are, I'm going to be working with and these undergraduates are coming from families where being Republican is part of their blood. Um, and it's part of their family's relationships and their relationships, their grandparents. And I didn't want to break that bond. And I remember thinking, you know, if I'm going to, um, you know, I wanted to remove myself from that politicized situation. And so what I would tell students in the first class is that, you know, I'm not, a liberal, I'm not a, or I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican, I'm Canadian. And it was actually one of the people then soon pretty much told me like, hey, you're just like Catherine Hayhoe, that's what she does and you need to check her out. She's also a Canadian. Um, and so, yeah, we had this really amazing kind of funny um, background where we're both Canadians, we're both from Toronto, both lived in, or you are still living in the conservative US town and, I wanted to start off with the first question by just kind of framing that. And I think a lot of Canadians think about the US as being a place where, where climate change is politicized and maybe not so much here. And I'm going to quickly share my screen with a map mm -hmm. just for the public. And I know you've seen this before, Catherine. So this is Canadian public opinions. And uh, I believe there's going to be a link shared to this so people in, and you are watching this can actually look and explore this website. It's really great impression or idea of what Canadians believe in terms of climate change and a lot of specific questions. But even just this percentage of adults who believe the earth is getting warmer, we can see that this kind of reflects our political divides across the country too. So we're facing the same kind of switches or the same kind of divides in Canada. And given that, I'm curious to hear what you think about in terms of you know, what's the best possible solution for getting either conservatives in Canada or Republicans in the US who are maybe doubtful about climate change to really be on board and become climate leaders in terms of action, what they can be doing? Well, first of all, I didn't know that that was what you did. It just makes me laugh because that, for those of you who don't know, is exactly what I did the first class that I taught in Texas. So, and my TED talk even starts off with this story. So I was teaching this undergraduate geology class and I was standing in for a colleague who was away and he had asked me to t teach on the history of the carbon cycle over the history of the earth. So, I mean, I was talking about carbon millions of years ago, and then I was talking about carbon hundreds of thousands of years ago. And then at the very end, I talked about how humans are tipping the balance, how by digging up and burning massive amounts of fossil fuels, we're putting all of this extra carbon into the atmosphere that ordinarily shouldn't be there for millions of years. And so, you know, it was one of those early morning classes and one of those cavernous, dark, subterranean rooms with no windows. And half of the students were on their computers anyways, you know, checking Facebook or social media. Um, that was back in the days when Facebook was still cool. Uh, 
And and then one one student put up his hand and I was like, oh, somebody has a question. So he stood up and I nodded and he said, are you a Democrat? And <laughs> I was so floored, I didn't know what to say. So my instinct was exactly the same as yours. I said, no, I'm Canadian. <laughs> because, you know, I had never really confronted the idea that the scientific information that we get from studying the history of the earth could somehow be perceived as political. But of course, fast forward to today, and climate change is and has been for the last 10 years, the most politicized issue in the United States. We often feel immune to it in Canada, but I can assure you we are not. So I'm on social media, I'm on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn, and I get a lot of attacks every single day as a matter of fact. And although the majority of them come from people who live in the US, quite a substantial fraction come from people who live in Canada. And when people attack me for saying that climate is changing and humans are responsible and the impacts are real, I can almost predict their social media platform or their profile before I click on it. They will be somebody who vehemently opposes the current prime minister and definitely the NDPs and absolutely the Green Party. They will likely have either a Canadian flag or an upside down Canadian flag on their profile, um, indicating that they feel like the country has been overrun <laughs> by people who they think do not support what the country originally stood for. Um, and it's part of this whole parcel of toxic um, nationalism driven by fear, driven by fear that the world is changing faster than we're comfortable with. And we're afraid that we and who we are and who we represent is being pushed to the back of the queue. So science denial, whether it's in the US or Canada or Australia, where they have a substantial amount of it as well too, or even in the UK or Europe, it has nothing to do with the science. If people really had a problem with basic physics, the same basic physics that explains how digging up and burning fossil fuels is wrapping an extra blanket around our planet, causing it to warm, they wouldn't be using their stoves or refrigerators either because it's the same physics. And they definitely wouldn't be using airplanes, also the same physics. They have a problem with what they perceive to be the solutions. And it's true, we have to wean ourselves off fossil fuels as much as possible, as soon as possible. There's no if, ands, buts about that. We have to invest in nature-based solutions that pull carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back in the soil and in the ecosystems where we want it, not just through tree planting, but through agriculture and ecological restoration. We have to adapt to the increasingly severe and very expensive supersized disasters that climate change is causing from heat waves and wildfires to sea level rise and hurricanes. It's true that we have to do this, but there are solutions that benefit people. And what a lot of people in Canada don't even realize is that having a price on carbon actually produces a net benefit for low and middle income families. There are all kinds of jobs capping oil wells and gas wells that are leaking heat trapping gases into the atmosphere. Warren Buffett, who's not exactly somebody you would see as an environmental philanthropist, is building the largest wind farm in Canada in Alberta, which creates the jobs in the center of our oil and gas industry. We have to think of what a just transition means to provide jobs for the people who are just feeding their families working in the oil fields, but we have to do so in a way that is fair and equitable and just, but in a way that accelerates our transition to a clean energy economy because every single one of us is being affected by climate change and a wildfire does not knock on your door and ask you which party you voted for before it burns down your house. That, that's great. And I mean, and I, I agree entirely and I, I think you know, one of the things that I'm having conversations about here too is this idea that, you know, part of me almost worries that we're leaving out a huge segment of the population by letting this sort of idea perpetuate that there's something political about climate change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, speaking to my students in Utah, one of the things I would talk about was how, you know, climate like politics has a really important role, which is how do we get to net zero? Um, that's a really great political discussion. Like what is the best way to get there? And there's, you know, many ways to do that. And that can be politically, you know, maybe they involve more taxation or more, more free market approaches, but the politics shouldn't be telling us is climate change science accurate. And so a lot of what I think about is how do we reposition that political ball to where it needs to be, where everyone is empowered to be part of that conversation and to feel like they're, you know, influencing the solutions that we're going to need to get behind. Exactly. I want conservative solutions to, to climate change to be discussed. Mm -hmm. And 
they are gradually improving. So not this past election, but the one before, the Conservatives' climate plan, according to economists and energy policy experts, would actually increase our heat trapping gas emissions rather than decrease them. So that's not a climate plan. It's yeah. like, oh, the ship is sinking. Let's make the hole bigger. No, but their plan in this last election was better. It was. Mm -hmm. So they're moving in the right direction, but unfortunately, there's still many, and now we have the People's Party of Canada, which their climate plan is, it's not real. Mm -hmm. There's still many, including the members of parliament who are conservative, who voted against just a simple, is climate change real yeah. <laughs> vote, which I can't believe they even would call that to vote. And the reality again is, we need everybody on board. We need all of our legislators saying, okay, it's real, it's us, it's serious, and we are going to put our best foot forward and bring our best solutions to the table. We need our best solutions from every single party across the entire political spectrum. And I think one of the things that we have in our favor in Canada, as opposed to in the US, is we have that plethora of political parties. Now, of course, there's pluses and minuses to having that many parties, but we have a huge range of ideas from across the spectrum. It isn't just over here or over there and you have to pick one or the other. We have a broad spectrum of perspectives that are coming um, with ideas and policies to bear on the climate crisis. And I think that that is a strength that we need to be taking advantage of and we need all of those voices as participants in the discussion. And unfortunately for a small minority, and by the way, poll EV link on the chat, you can pose questions. We already have a great question, which I'm gonna Lincoln right here, which is, is it helpful to stereotype people? Well, a small percentage of people are dismissive. And dismissive is um, a phrase actually from the Yale Program on Climate Communication who created that uh, figure that um, Soren just shared. And I'm gonna share a second figure because I think it's so useful to look at this. Um, we don't fall into two camps, believers and deniers when it comes to climate change. We fall into at least six groups. This is just one way to look at it. It's not the definitive way. But even in the United States, this is data for the US, majority of people are alarmed, concerned, or cautious. Only a few percentage are dismissive. And dismissive people are, are people who are so convinced there's nothing we can do to fix the problem that there's really no convincing them short of a miracle. I'll put the link to that in the chat so you can see that at your leisure if you're interested. But aside from people who are dismissive, most people are just worried. They're afraid, they've been told that there's no solutions that will give them a better future. But the reality is we all want a better future, all of us. We want a better future. We want a safe place to live and raise our children. We want clean air to breathe and we want clean water to come out of the tap when we turn it on. We want there to be food in the grocery store. We want there to be that amazing and abundant nature that we as Canadians so enjoy. We want there to be a safe world so we're not constantly worried about friends and family and people who are in the middle of war and crises. We all want those things. And if we don't fix climate change, we're not gonna get those things. And so when it all comes down to it, whoever we are is already the perfect person to care. But we just have to figure out why it is that they, we care about those things. And so that's why in my book, I talk so much about how it isn't about everybody has to care about X and then they can care about climate change. No, everybody already has something they care about that is already being affected by climate change. And we have to figure out what that is and help them connect the dots for themselves. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. And I think that it's really important to be framing it that way and understanding it that way um, and having those personal connections. One of the things I really loved reading your book, and one of the things that stuck with me was this also this idea that um, I think you mentioned meeting someone where they were a climate denier, they were, um, you know, kind of almost like aggressive with you, but then it turns out you could bond over knitting and that they wanted to live a low carbon lifestyle, even without knowing it and being a climate denier. And this kind of almost felt like a eureka moment of you can bond with people over the solutions, even if you disagree over the causes of why we need to get there. And I think there's a lot of people who feel like climate change, you know, we just need more data. We need to push people to believe and say that climate change is real. But it's like, you know, I'm curious to hear a little bit more elaboration on that from your perspective. Can we just agree to do the solution without even necessarily coming to the same terms about why, you know, what the climate change science is? If that's a sticking point for them, can we leave that behind us? 100% in my opinion. And I'm a scientist, so it pains me to say that. You know, as a scientist, right, we would we would prefer to just give everybody the facts and have everybody say, oh, of course, you're right. We have to act as soon as possible, <laughs> but we don't live in that world. 
we've been giving people the facts. And when I say we, I don't just mean you and me, but I mean us scientists all together. We've been giving people the facts for over a hundred years. You know, it's been 55 years since scientists formally warned, formally warned a U.S. president of the risks of climate change and the need for action. We have provided all the facts people needed to act, and yet two-thirds of human carbon emissions have been emitted during my lifetime, way after that formal warning to a U.S. president about the need to act. So it's clear that more scientific facts are not going to help. And at this point, they even can hurt. Why? Because when we are already overwhelmed and over 75% of people in Canada and over 70% of people in the US are already worried about climate change, believe it or not, but we don't talk about it. And only a tiny fraction of us are activated. What's holding us back from being activated? Not more news about ice sheets melting and polar bears starving. What's holding us back from being activated is we don't know how we can make a difference. So the most important thing we can do is talk about what we can do to make a difference. And that's literally why I wrote my book. And then what's holding back those who are not worried because they're afraid of the solutions. They don't know what they could do that would be positive and constructive. So talking about the solutions there helps them out too. So it really is a discussion about what those solutions look like at the individual level, you know, solutions like food waste and uh, eating differently and traveling differently and getting our energy from different sources. But much more important than our personal carbon footprint is our climate shadow. How do we engage with the university that we're part of? Where do they get their energy from? Have they done an energy audit of their buildings? Have they divested from fossil fuels? Um, how, are we teaching climate change across the whole spectrum so it isn't just an environmental science issue? It is the defining issue of our age. I had the opportunity to speak to Canadian university presidents recently, and they asked me, what should universities be doing? And I said, they should be teaching every student in every field why this matters to their field and how they can contribute to solutions, whether you're in business, whether you're in media and communications, whether you're studying law or medicine or physical sciences or life sciences or art or writing. Whoever you are, you have something to contribute. And I work with people in all those fields. And then, you know, someone pushed back a bit and said, well, you know, why should we be doing this? And my answer was, and I'm sorry to be very blunt about this, but I think you could back me up as a climate scientist. If we don't fix the climate crisis, we may not have the luxury of higher education in a hundred years. Human civilization is what is quite literally on the chopping block here. It's the future of our universities we're fighting for or our places of work or our organizations that we're part of or the neighborhood that we live in or the city that we're in. Whoever we are, we're part of circles that are bigger than ourselves. And when we use our voice to advocate for change in our city, in our organization, the place we work, the place we study, the place we worship, the group that we're part of, whether it's ultimate frisbee or kayaking or bird watching or a PTA group or a mom's group at the playground or a dog walking group, using our voice is the number one way that we can change the system and change the world. Now, as a fellow scientist, does anything I say <laughs> ring false or would you like to add to that? No, I mean, I, I agree entirely. And, and but I mean, on that note, I feel like I've spoken to a lot of people who have expressed, you know, wish that, you know, if it wasn't for their all encompassing or all consuming job, that they, you know, they would do more for the climate, but it's, you know, they're really focused and you know, get up in the morning, you do your job, and your job doesn't involve climate change as part of it or solving the climate change crisis. And then you take the kid home from work, go to bed, and you're too tired by the time you go to bed. But I was thinking, I mean, for you personally, I mean, you are. You have an outstanding record as an atmospheric scientist, as a political scientist, as a climate change communicator. I'm curious just to hear your own feeling in your own personal life. Do you ever feel that there's um, a push and pull between these multiple aspects of your life or do you have to compromise other areas or is it something that kind of just weaves together? How did you end up being able to do all these things at once? I'm curious. Well, well, it, it definitely, there's definitely never enough time in the day. And if anybody ever figures out how to get a 25 hour day, I'm all for that. <laughs> but, but that said, I would challenge people because what we need more than, than, well, I don't know more. We need, we need this equally. Let's just be equal about this. We need people who are dedicated to tackling the climate crisis, who bring every different unique skill that they have. Like I said, from um, skills in communication to skills in law to skills in policy to skills in engineering and development and invention and design. We need everybody working directly on the climate crisis who is able to, but we also 
really badly, and at this point I feel like the need is almost more urgent in this area, need people who are embedded within our existing organizations and systems to advocate for change. If you're in the banking industry, wow, that is a huge area where we need change because transitioning from, fo from funding new fossil fuel development to funding new clean energy development or efficiency programs is absolutely essential. And voices within that sector is how we raise that awareness. If you're in the pet food industry. <laughs> Did you know that if you have a large sized dog, they could eat the equivalent in the carbon emissions of a passenger car every year. So there's people in the pet food industry who are looking at creating protein rich, sustainable food, like based off crickets, for example, that give our pets what they need to be healthy, but don't produce a ton of carbon emissions, right? Um, you could have people at newspapers who are advocating for, hey, don't just put the climate stories on the environmental page. We should have climate stories in the fashion section, in the lifestyle section, in the real estate section, definitely in the politics section. Wherever you are, you could be a teacher. You could be a parent. You could work at a museum. <laughs> and actually, that's a good, a good segue into asking you about your job. Wherever you are, you can use your voice to advocate for change no matter what organization you are part of. And there, one of the most amazing stories I heard um, from my book, and I've heard so many great stories, is the Presbyterian Church of Ireland recently voted to do two things, to divest from fossil fuels and to invest in the community of people whose livelihoods are dependent on the fossil fuel industry. And when they did that, they said that they started with having conversations about it before they brought it to vote, obviously, because of what my book said. And so just the fact that whoever you are, you're, you're somewhere that nobody else is. And because you're there, you can have these conversations about what you can do within your organization, within your sector even, to help move the ball forward at every level. So with me, what I did was, I, I focused my science on looking at how climate change affects us at the local to regional scale where we live. How many more days do we have in the city of Toronto over 35 degrees Celsius than we used to have 20 years ago? How many more winters do we have with hardly any snow compared to what we used to have? What was that gonna look like in 10 or 20 years, depending on the choices we make? If we go this way, here's what it will look like, but if we go that way, here's what it will look like. Here's what our flood risk will look like, our energy demand, our extreme heat. Here's what's gonna to happen to our ski resorts. Here's what's gonna to happen to the wine grapes in Niagara. I work with people who ask these questions. Oh, the maple syrup industry. Don't even get me started on that. <laughs> I work with people who, I don't know much about maple trees other than I had them in my backyard, obviously growing up, but there's a lot of people who study them and they need information on how climate is changing and what that means for the future of maple syrup production. Um, I love to ski, but I don't run a ski resort, but there's people who look at that and, and determine what they would need to keep viable in the future. Um, I'm not a city planner, but there's great city planners in the city of Toronto and beyond who understand where our flood risk is, what our energy demand looks like, how climate change is going to be putting major stresses on a lot of other big cities around the world, and people are going to be possibly looking to cities like Toronto and Chicago that have the Great Lakes, that aren't at sea level, that are surrounded by agricultural land to even grow and hold more people in the future than they do today, and we have to prepare for those types of things too. So integrating all of that into why climate change matters really gives me the basis I need to have, these, have conversations with people across the spectrum about what we can do about climate change and how every single one of us is already the perfect person to care. Whoever we are, whatever we work in, I have, you know, 99, no, probably about 999 times out of a thousand, I could show you some way that what you care about, who you love, where you love, what you love, where you work, is being affected by a changing climate. So if you don't mind, just in a nutshell, tell people you're at a museum. Why do you think a museum needs to be talking about climate change? I mean, that's something I've obviously, obviously been putting a lot of thought on since starting working here, but I mean, I think the museum is just a really powerful place to be telling it. You have, I mean, as you know, you've visited the ROM growing up as well as I did. I mean, it has arts and cultures and nature. It has all of these different um, objects that are actually really wonderful ways to, to talk about the human elements of climate change and talk about the history of climate change. We have a new gallery, the Dawn of Life Gallery, that's four billion years of life on earth, and it has the first four major extinctions and they all have the climate links to them. So there's really kind of neat opportunities that just weaves together all of this stuff and, and being able to talk about, you know, give context to the climate crisis and talk about the history of it and look at biodiversity loss and the role of humans and the role, you know, all of these different things and, you know, even Little Ice Age I started talking about. So there's, it's, and 
again, also having come from, from academia, it's really exciting to be now having a, a group of people who aren't, you know, there's not a certain political um, spectrum that want to go see the dinosaurs at the ROM. You know, this is a really kind of broader group of society that you can directly engage with and listen to and have that conversation with. Well, I love that you said that because, um, so I'm from Etobicoke, in case people don't know. Um, my dad is a science teacher, and um, until he retired, he was actually the science coordinator for the TDSB. So if you know a hey-ho, yes, they are a relative of mine. <laughs> um, and one of my first memories as a child is going to the ROM, and I loved the dinosaur in the front hall. On the snowy Saturdays, my parents would bundle us all up, and they would take us down to the ROM on the, sub on the, on the subway, and we'd go to the planetarium, and we'd go to the ROM. And so you're right. It, it, it attracts the cross, you know, across the spectrum of people, and museums are very trusted messengers, mm -hmm. reaching people through curiosity about science. Now, I'm going to actually pull in a question that we have here. So don't forget, put your questions in Poly V and upvote them because we won't have time to do all of them because we have so many good questions. But I see one that's directly relevant to what we we're just talking about. Um, we're formulating a climate change tour for the ROM, but the guidance is don't be too depressive because it doesn't sell tickets. <laughs> what should my approach be? So I hear this because I now serve on the board of the Smithsonian Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C. on the mall. And don't worry, the ROM is my first love. <laughs> but I'm taking that love and helping other museums as well. And so they were designing that exhibit, that deep time exhibit, like you were just talking about. They recently designed that and they opened it up just before COVID, where they redid their entire fossil hall and they placed that within the context of how climate has changed over the billions of years of the Earth's history. <laughs> but they went one step further and they had the Anthropocene, which is the Anthropocene, of course, is the geologic era defined by human influence, showing how we humans have already altered the planet but they were very sure to, and they actually did this through a series of short movies, include what solutions look like. How school kids are working to restore oysters to the New York Harbor, which cleans the water, improves biodiversity, and takes up carbon. How in West Texas, where I live, you know, farmers in West Texas who would never, ever vote Democrat, they are practicing regenerative agricultural practices that put carbon back in the soil because it also fertilizes their crops and helps them be more drought resistant. So it's so important to talk about the risk and the reward, 50-50. We have to talk about why it matters here and now, not just to the polar bears or the ice sheets, but right here in the city of Toronto. And believe me, there is plenty of things we can talk about. Flooding, heat, the wildfire smoke that we were breathing in just last summer, um, the fact that every you know our winters are much different, our spring's coming earlier, and then you get like a massive snowstorm just after everything started to bloom. Talk about what's happening here and now, but also talk about what real solutions look like. So I would say, as you formulate that tour, talk about what First Nations are doing around Ontario to be part of the climate solution. Talk about what the city of Toronto and surrounding cities are doing to be part of the climate solution. Talk about what organizations, even companies are doing to be part of the climate solution. Talk about, talk about what kids are doing to be part of that climate solution. If possible, incorporate that into your displays and material and information as well as into the information in the tour. So people come away, they start with the risk, but they come away inspired, encouraged, and motivated because they realize that it is not on the prime minister to fix this problem. It is on every single one of us and there's something every one of us can do. And that is quite literally why I wrote my book because when systems change, it isn't because the prime minister, the president, or the CEO decide that they're gonna change. It's because ordinary people decide they have to change and we use our voice to call for change until the leaders can no longer ignore our voices. That's that's great. And I mean, I think one of the most powerful messages from your book and the reason it's so powerful is that we just have to have conversations and that that's, mm -hmm. you know, no matter where you are in life, that's something that you can do and something that's really powerful. Um, you don't have to be, you know, I think it's you said before, like a David Suzuki or, you know, don't have to have a major job. You can, you know, you can really, make change at every level. Um, well, it's so funny that you say that because that's exactly the perspective I used to have. So um, as an undergraduate at U of T, I studied astrophysics. I was doing a double major in astronomy and physics and I was planning to, I was studying galaxy clustering around quasars. And I always thought of climate change as one of those environmental issues that David Suzuki is going to take care of. And the rest of us watch his documentaries and wish him well. Oh, he's got Elizabeth May to help him too. That's great. There's two of them. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, that's the way I thought about it. And then I took this class on climate change at U of T that was a brand new class. 
And I was completely shocked to realize, first of all, that climate modeling was the same physics that I've been learning in physics and astronomy. I don't know what I thought it was, but I didn't think it was that. But I was even more shocked to realize that climate change is a justice issue, that it affects every single human and every living thing on this planet, but it affects those of us who've done the least to contribute to the problem the most, whether it is women and children who are unhoused, living on the streets of Halifax, or whether it is farmers trying to feed their families in sub-Saharan Africa, whoever has done the least to contribute to the problem is bearing the brunt of the impacts. And that was really what changed my whole perspective on the issue and made me realize I personally need to do everything I can to help change the dialogue and change the trajectory that we're on. Oh, that's great. And I think that that's probably a good spot to move on to the questions. So because um, the time is just playing and I don't know how 20 minutes just know, flew by like that. I know. And there's tons of great questions. And don't forget, like, go to the questions right now, upvote the ones you want us to get to, because there's too many of them. Add yours if you want. And just to reiterate, yes, if you know a hey ho, I am related to them. <laughs> I see another question on that in the in the side. Yes. Every time I do like a CBC interview, my dad gets all of these um, like calls. Oh, is that your daughter? <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, but before I forget, then I just want to make sure that I do get the chance to thank you for joining us for today's program and for sharing your thoughts on the climate crisis and how to reframe it. And yeah, so we'll move on to some questions. And just to reiterate what, what you just said, Catherine, please submit your questions to us. Um, you can use the poll everywhere function, which has been provided in the, uh, in the chat box if you're not already there. And that allows you to also upvote other people's questions. If you don't have a question, of your own that you think would be that you could come up with but if you see another question someone's asked that you would like to be answered exactly. so i'm just going to pull that up here and um and i'll go from the well so we have a couple questions here we can go with oh there's eight votes for a lot of fossil fuel companies are now investing in renewable energy sources how can we support their investment in renewables while showing our condemnation of continued exploitation of oil and gas resources I think it's really important to recognize that, yeah, not everybody's the same. And there are definitely some companies that are helping with the transition, moving us towards using all the enormous technology and resources and know-how that they have to look at how could we create low carbon or zero carbon liquid fuels, which we badly need. Um, how could we be contributing to you know, developing battery storage? How could we be using um, you know, the, the abilities and the knowledge they have to really help to accelerate this transition because they still want to be energy companies in the future. And the transition is happening no matter what. The question is just, is it going to happen fast enough to save us from climate change? That's the only question. So um, do a bit of research. There's a lot of ranking schemes that people are doing lately to talk about what different banks are doing, what different oil and gas companies are doing, what different um, power companies are doing. Of course, in the US, that's more of a private thing. Um, but there's a lot of different rankings out there. So do your homework with the rankings. And also, it does not hurt to reach out, right? And in fact, there's some investors that are doing exactly this as a strategy, like with ExxonMobil, which is one of the more resistant companies. There's, a, there's an organization called Engine Number no. One, and it's an investment platform where they deliberately bought into the company so they could then show up at the shareholder meetings <laughs> and um, propose and garner support for climate resolutions. And in fact, there's one of them that they're just voting on right now for their scope three emissions. So there's a lot of different ways to engage. There's no one size fits all, here's what everybody should do. And in a way that that often kind of stymies people because they're like, okay, well, if there's no like A, B, C, D, what am I supposed to do? I sort of see that as a positive because it means there's something for all of us to do. And people sit, say, what should I be doing? My answer is do something, anything, and then talk about it. Great. Hmm. I'm going to jump to a next question here, which has high ratings. So what advice would you give a young professional with expertise in social science research, such as psychology or social work and training in communication who wants to enter a career in science communication or the psychology of effectively motivating public about climate change? Oh, well, that that is very near and dear to my heart because that is exactly where I have transitioned myself in terms of my career from more of a, you know, a very physical based science to really trying to understand how do we motivate people to act. And according to the research, which I read a ton of before I wrote my book, um, it really is what we lack is a sense of efficacy. 
efficacy is a concept that was invented by or created I should say or named really because it existed before it was named by a psychologist who just recently passed away um, from Stanford University Banderas and it's the idea that if I do something can I make a difference if we do something together can we make a difference we have a stunning lack of efficacy in general not just related to climate change we feel like there's too many people in the world who would listen to me so I think that what you're doing is great. And I think there's a lot of organizations that focus on that. So in the United States, there's an organization called RARE. Um, in the UK, there's an organization called Climate Outreach. There's also the Yale Program on Climate Communication, which is a leader and they have collaborators at the University of Montreal and other places. Um, all of these are organizations that go really in depth in this. Um, and then there's individual uh, researchers at universities all over the place who study this and you can find this out by just looking at what they've published and what they're studying so if you want to go the academic route there's a lot of different places that you could go to study this if you want to go more of the um, of the working in it professionally right now it's very much in the nonprofit world but I feel like it needs to be transitioning into government I mean don't you feel like the government really needs people who understand how you effectively motivate people like where are the bus shelter posters with you know jim and nancy from red deer saying here's how much money we got back from the carbon price this year and this is what we did with that money or you know where's the person who lives up in sudbury saying you know we got a rebate on efficiency and so we winterized our home and here's how much money we saved like where are the bus shelter posters showing individual efficacy to the policies we already have in place in our country, let alone the policies that are coming in the future. So I think you're in just the right spot. And I personally feel like people should be beating down the doors trying to hire you, <laughs> is my personal bias. Um, I think almost any organization, including museums obviously, need that type of information. And I'm even serving in that capacity myself with the, with the Smithsonian. How do we design um, exhibits and information, convey information that gives people a sense of efficacy? I think you're badly needed almost anywhere. And so if you feel like there's a place that needs you, I would pitch yourself to them. <laughs> but in the meantime, do a bit of research, find out what organizations are doing that. And if you're looking for uh, a position with that organization, just reach out to them. And my best advice for students and for young professionals is ask for an informational interview. Um, be very respectful of people's time. Don't reach out for the person in charge, but reach out for somebody that's sort of one level above where you would want to come in and say, I would really love to know you know more about what you do who you look for you know what skills your job requires would you be willing to give me 30 minutes of your time and just give me some information and that might lead you to they might you know afterwards you could follow up and they might say sure send me your cv and we'll keep you in mind next time or it could just give you ideas of where else to look so i'm a big proponent of informational interviews i did them myself and that has certainly had a huge influence on my career that's great thank you so much uh, another highly voted question here is, do you think the war in Ukraine is shifting public opinion around the need and urgency to transition to renewables? Oh, yes, especially in Europe, where they have a direct pipeline to Russian oil and gas. Um, the war itself is, in addition to the, the vast, vast human toll it's exerting. And I say this from a personal <laughs> perspective as well, because 100 years ago, it was my great grandparents who were fleeing Western Ukraine during a Russian invasion. And they were the fortunate ones who made it to Toronto. And my family's been in Toronto ever since. Half of their family didn't make it to Toronto. And there's many families now in the exact same circumstances. In addition to that, there's tremendous toll being exerted on, you know, how it affects um, biodiversity, how it affects our ecosystems, how it affects our agriculture, our ability to produce food, and how it's affecting the global fossil fuel market. Right now, fossil fuel companies are raking in the profits hand over fist due to soaring gas prices, right? But in Europe, they are going as fast as possible for, and I, and I don't care what reason it is, whatever reason it is that moves, I mean, let me qualify that. I care very deeply that it is such a horrible reason as the war in Ukraine. But any reason that gets us moving faster is good because I want to quote a Ukrainian climate scientist, Svetlana Krakowska. She's an IPCC author. And as she, as the bombs were starting to fall that first weekend when the war began, she was on Zoom finalizing the final um, text for the IPCC report that was released. And this is what she said. She said, climate change and the war on Ukraine have the same roots, fossil fuels. 
And she said, just as we will not surrender in Ukraine, we must not surrender in building a better world, referring to climate change. So unfortunately, in some places, this isn't happening. In the United States, where I live, there's calls to ramp up oil and gas production, which are not going to fix the problem. Why? Number one, it's going to take years to ramp up the production to the point where it would make a difference. And number two, as long as you're tied to the international market, which you know fossil fuels are obviously tied to the international market, the price shocks and the price signals are always going to affect your domestic production. There is no way for internal fossil fuel production to be cut off from the rest of the world. That just isn't the way our economic system works. And so renewable energy, first of all, tackles climate change, but renewable energy also cleans up our air. Did you know 10 million people, 10 million people a year around the world die from air pollution prematurely every year from burning fossil fuels. That's double the number of COVID premature deaths every single year. Then we've got the issues of the extraction of fossil fuels exerting massive environmental impact on the local communities. Uh, many of them, not just in Canada, but around the world in indigenous communities. Then we've got the fact that again, burning these fossil fuels creates air pollution. And then we've got the fact that there's climate change. And then we've got the fact that they are literally fueling the war on Ukraine. I mean, there's so many reasons to wean ourselves off fossil fuels. At this point, you're just kind of shaking your head and saying, why aren't we doing this? And of course, we have to do it with a just transition. We have to do it recognizing that there's people in our country who depend on the oil and gas industry to feed their families, just literally put food on the table. We have to incorporate a plan to enable them to be able to continue to do so, but we have to do it as soon as possible for the benefit of every single one of us. Great. There's so many great questions just flooding in here. It's amazing. But uh, uh, you, you have an extra hour to sit around and talk about these, oh, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the next one here, moving forward, is are there any risks to simplifying climate teachings to just CO2 emissions? So are there other human factors that are impacting climate that we should be talking about? Um, so so we um, probably the answer is yes and no. Um, so 75% of the problem comes from fossil fuels. And that's of course carbon dioxide, but also methane. Methane is a very powerful heat trapping gas, 35 times stronger than CO2. And when natural gas leaks out of our old uncapped oil wells, it just goes straight into the atmosphere where it has a bigger short-term warming effect than CO2. But that's all the fossil fuel industry together. 75% is fossil fuels. 25% of the problem um, and this is at the global level, I'm not setting Canadian numbers, I'm setting the global numbers, 25% of the problem is land use change and agriculture. That includes deforestation, and it includes large scale agricultural, um, industrial agriculture, like especially cows and other ruminants that produce huge amounts of methane through incomplete digestion. There's also the impact of fertilizers that contain nitrous oxide, which is another powerful heat trapping gas. So 75% fossil fuels and then 25% land use change and agriculture. But the good news is, is there's a lot of solutions. And again, we talked about this earlier, but this relates to the same question. There's no silver bullet. There is no one thing that if we did a one thing, it would fix the whole problem. Now, I know I hear from people every day who say that there is. I hear from people every day who say, if everybody did X, that would fix the whole problem. And X might be a good solution, but it is not going to fix the whole problem. We need a broad range of solutions, but the good news is, is that means there's something for everybody to do, right? So we need solutions in the food sector that reduce our food waste, because in Canada, we throw out, according to one food survey, 58% of the food we produce, it goes to waste. So we need people who work on food waste, and there are grocery stores who are working on that today, and I talk about that in my book. We need people who can figure out how to produce food without so much producing so much heat trapping gases. And we have a lot of people doing that. You know, it was a farmer in PEI who discovered sort of accidentally, I think, that if his cows ate seaweed, they produced a lot less methane. And today there's universities all around the world trying to figure out how to grow seaweed at scale and feed it to cows to cut their methane emissions. But then there's nature-based solutions with agriculture, like growing cover crops that take CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it back into the ground where we want it, that also help to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. And that's part of, um, so I'm the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy, which is known as Nature United in Canada. And we've actually calculated that through nature-based solutions, a lot of them relate to agriculture. 
we could be pulling out as a country 11 percent of our emissions every year just through nature-based solutions that also invest in our ecosystems and our agriculture so there's a lot of different different solutions and um, drawdown project drawdown which um, we're going to put link in the chat there drawdown.org has fantastic solutions across the spectrum that we can tell people about and engage people on so the science of climate change is pretty simple digging up and burning fossil fuels deforestation and industrial agriculture producing heat trapping gases wrapping extra blanket around the planet that's the science but the solutions we have a multitude of and there's something for everybody in that wonderful I am going to give you one last quick question. Yeah. This is at the very end here, and this is one that's coming from your own home turf, from Etobicoke. Excellent. Uh, writing from Etobicoke, wondering what your advice you would have for suburbs like ours who want to tra transform to a low carbon way of life. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So, so again, there's no one silver bullet, but there's a lot of silver buckshot, so to speak. You have to look at where are you getting your electricity from? right? Clean sources versus fossil fuels. And we already get a lot of our energy from sources like hydro that aren't no, but they're low emissions. But then did you know efficiency? Efficiency is the low hanging fruit. A lot of us, including my family in Etobicoke, live in older homes. And through efficiency and weatherization, we can save a ton of money and we don't need as much energy. Then we have to look at transportation. You know, I lived out in Etobicoke and I took the bus and the subway down to U of T every day for four years during the week. That's a long way to go. We need to continue to invest in our public transportation and make it the cheapest and easiest way to travel as opposed to traveling by car. We also need to look again at our food systems, food waste, increased availability of plant-based food, um, uh, looking at where and how we grow our food and make it available. We need all of those solutions and we need the educational solutions as well. We need people to understand why it matters and how we have to build resilience to crazy summer heat waves, to increasing risk of floods, to changing patterns in rainfall and snow, to invasive species moving in like the ticks that carry Lyme disease. So my husband's from Virginia and he grew up, you know, running through the woods every summer and his mother would have to check him for ticks every night because they had ticks. Well, so I grew up, you know, we were fortunate enough to, um, all of my, my greater family have, have cottages up in the Muskoka area and have done for over a hundred years. And so I grew up, you know, running through, through the woods and my mother never checked me for ticks <laughs> once because we didn't have them. Well, it turns out we have them now and people are getting Lyme disease all through Southern Ontario. We have kudzu in Southern Ontario, which came all the way up from the Southern US. It's known as the vine that ate the South. Well, it could be the vine that ate Southern Ontario pretty soon if we don't deal with it. So we need to understand the resilience. We need to understand the, the, the mitigation solutions. There's so much that we can do. And you know what? It begins with a conversation. And let me end with this story because this is a great story to end with. So in December, 2018, I gave a TED talk called the most important thing you can do about climate change is talk about it. And I'll put a link there. And a couple of months later, five months later, to be specific, I was in London doing one of my bundled trips. In my book, I talk about how when I travel, I only travel when I have enough things to do in the same place to make it worthwhile. And so I typically travel somewhere and I'm there for like a week or a week and a half or two weeks. And I stay somewhere and I like take the train out to all the different places that I'm going to do. Um, speak at or visit people or have meetings at. So I was in London and I was at the end of a very long day. It had started with a breakfast in the city at like 7 a.m. And this was, I think, like the fifth event that day. <laughs> it was a talk at the London School of Economics. And I was walking back down the aisle and I could not wait to just put my feet up and have a cup of tea. So there was a man waiting to talk to me, I could tell. And so I stopped and he introduced himself and he said, I watched your TED talk. And I'm part of the borough of Wandsworth, which is a suburb of London. They have boroughs just like we used to too. We used to be the borough of Etobicoke, right? I'm part of the borough of Wandsworth and I was so frustrated. I've been pushing for climate action in forever and we just hadn't been doing anything. But I watched your TED talk and I realized I wasn't having conversations with people about why it mattered and what solutions look like. So I just decided to back off and start having conversations. And I've kept a list of all the conversations that I've had and the conversations the people that I talked to have had and the conversations that the people they've talked to have had. Would you like to see the list? I thought, well, that's an interesting thing. I've never heard that before. I said, sure. So he reached in his bag and he pulled out this list. And I was expecting, you know, maybe 75 or 80 names. Turns out he had 10,000 names on his list of people that he had had conversations with in the borough of Wandsworth. 
And he said because of that, the city council just voted to declare a climate emergency. And then just before COVID, they voted to um, put up 20 million pounds, which is a fair amount of money for a small borough, for a climate action plan. And then they just messaged me last week and they said, now the city of Wandsworth has a let's talk climate change program for the whole city where they get citizens together to talk about why it matters and what they could do to fix it. So wouldn't that be amazing to have that in Etobicoke too? Have a program and have it in Scarborough and have it in North York and have it in the city of Toronto, have it like in the Annex and the Danforth, <laughs> the High Park area have these conversations where we bring everybody's brains together and we say, what could we be doing together? Because we all live here. We all want a better world. We want a safe home. We want a good place to, um, for our children to grow up. And I'm going to give you the link to that Wandsworth campaign that they just sent me. I just put it in the chat there. It all started with one man called Glenn who was not a city council person, he was not a scientist, he was not a rich, influential business owner in the community. He was one person who used the superpower that every single one of us has, which is our voice. And through that, he's changing the place that he lives.